Okay, well, I think we have some good numbers here, so might as well get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking the time. We really appreciate you being here for this really exciting talk that we have planned for you all. Uh, so we're here today as um, a group because the, the 2021 cohort of the Innovation and Global Development PhD program here at Arizona State University has been tasked with putting on a talk series under the umbrella of De Development Reimagined. And today we will focus on what we've termed invisible dimensions of infrastructure. So before I get into that, I just wanna put out a few different things to a couple groups here. One is our professor and the head of the Innovation Global Development Program, Dr. Netra Chetri. Another one is the ASU's technical team who without uh, their help, this event would not be possible. And finally, my cohort for all the hard work getting us to this point in time, uh, we have Luke, Prashamsha, Marta, Teal, Caitlin, and Pauline here. So on to the topic at hand, uh, invisible infrastructure. We chose this really relevant, current, and, and very important topic to kind of embody two overlapping areas. The first is the, the non-physical non infrastructural elements that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. This can include anything from social, institutional, or even technological networks. The second, are those individuals or the groups overlooked by these uneven or potentially even unequitable ways in which these infrastructures are built, accessed, or experienced? So today we hope to shed a little bit of light with our guest speaker here and hope to elucidate uh, a form of synergy between these two very important and relative topics. Before we get to our speaker, um, just a quick housekeeping item I want to address. We designed this talk to be very engaging. So while the first portion of it will uh, partake of a presentation by our speaker, the rest of the time will be allotted for a live Q&A session. So with that being said, we encourage all of you to think of various questions that you'd like our panelists to answer. And Zoom has a little function where you can drop your questions right in the Q&A section at the bottom. So at any point in time, if you have a question or comment, feel free to throw it in there. And one of our team members will make sure that question get asked. And for those of you who are here in person, first of all, congratulations, welcome. It's exciting to be back in person for an event. But at any point in time, if you have a question, feel free to just flag one of our teammates and we'll make sure that you get the opportunity to speak. So uh, without further ado, I am very pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Brad Allenby from the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation here at Arizona State University. Now, I have to say, I've never had a dull conversation with Brad, where every topic that we end up speaking about is just extremely fascinating and really just leaves you at the end of your seat wanting to hear more from him. So with that said, I'm very excited to hear him speak today. Brad, a little bit about his background. He's enjoyed a long and extensive career spanning from private sector all the way to academia. His current research investigates the ethical and social dimensions of emerging technology, the development of sustainable engineering theory, and my personal favorite, the rise of the cognitive ecosystem. So we've asked him here today and are very honored with his presence to talk about his views on some of the previous mentioned topics, as well as his views on the invisible infrastructure and hope to shape uh, a little bit of our future and our thoughts moving forward with this very important and current uh, topic. So Brad, I uh, welcome you to the stage and um, I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here. Great. Thanks, Ricky. Um... I'll start the slides in a second. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody here uh, and encourage uh, challenges and questions. I'm going to be taking a primarily technological approach, but I think it's important from the beginning to understand that there's essentially two schools of definition of infrastructure. One is as a physical thing. Uh, uh, a water system, uh, uh, power lines, whatever. The second is to understand infrastructure as the designed structures that lie between humans and their external environment, which means necessarily it includes the elements of invisible infrastructure. Because of the way we teach, because of the limited cognitive abilities of individual humans and for a whole slew of other reasons, we tend to focus on physical infrastructure and we don't uh, talk about the linked uh, 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 infrastructures of institutions, cultures, ec uh, economies, practices, the whole suite of things without which of course, infrastructure as a functioning entity doesn't exist. Uh, that approach is becoming more and more uh, untenable depending on what you are tasked to understand. Uh, 
And I think beginning with the broad approach will help us understand uh, some fundamental things about infrastructure. Uh, that said, I'm talking about design systems which can be either intentional or unintentional. The climate is a design system. Presumably, it was unintentional and it remains unintentional. Uh, a car, such as the one behind me, is an intentionally designed system. Again, I think we need to be very careful to include unintentionally designed systems because otherwise we tend not to recognize them as infrastructure. And that means that we don't have to take responsibility for it, which is where I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of our current positions fall down. So let me go to the slides. I'm gonna be very quick on these, by the way. So uh, what I miss, let's bring up in questions. Okay. Uh, I wanna start with a quote from Heidegger for, for a couple of reasons. One is, um, I think it's always important to begin an engineering presentation with a quote from a German metaphysician. Uh, and the second is I wanna, I want to pay particular attention to that second statement. The flight into tradition can bring about nothing in itself other than self-deception and blindness. One of the problems when you begin looking at infrastructure broadly is precisely that we approach it from tribal perspectives. That is to say, we deliberately blind ourselves and deceive ourselves before we even begin grappling with the complexity of the system. Uh, that's a very human thing to do. Uh, I don't say that as a criticism, I say it as an observation and one that perhaps one might want to keep an eye on in oneself. I'm going to talk about a few technologies really, really quickly. My point is not any of these case studies. My point is to give you a feeling for how rapidly and how fundamentally the world around us is changing going to, to Ricky's point about invisible infrastructure and equity implications, the equity implications of the way the world is shifting are huge, mostly unperceived because we choose not to perceive how the world is changing. And even if we do perceive it, we choose not to take responsibility for it, which is a very good way to avoid all of the ethical uh, problems. Radical life extension. Uh, when I look out at my class, uh, my engineering class, 100 plus people uh, who tend to be somewhere between uh, 18 and 25. Uh, I wonder to myself how many of them are going to live uh, to 150 with a high quality of life, because some of them probably will, given the advances we're making in medical science. Now, that gets really interesting because if I can keep you alive to 150 from this point, given the rapidity of change uh, and of, of uh, research in medical science, I can probably keep you alive for a much longer time. So what are the ethical and systemic implications of uh, essentially engineered immortality? The answer is we don't know because nobody uh, really wants to think about that kind of thing. Custom designed atmosphere. Uh, the approach we've taken to climate change into much deeper integrated questions, which again, we don't pay too much attention to, um, is that the, the response is going to be simple. Simply say no, stop emissions. Uh, that would be fine if the emissions were in fact uh, the problem. The problem is you've got a globe uh, with 8 billion people on it, all of whom want a good life and a better life for their children. The problem also is that the way we posed the initial issue back when we did the UN process and we came up with Kyoto was basically just say no, just say no to emissions, uh, which is in practice worked just about as well as Nancy Reagan's just say no to drugs program. But once you understand that we can begin to suck CO2 from the atmosphere, which of course we can, then the problem gets much, much more complicated from an invisible infrastructure perspective because it's no longer just, how do I make those evil people stop emitting? It's what atmosphere do you want? Do you want 280? Do you want 350, which is back a little from where we are? 350 essentially parts per million CO2. Uh, I can give you that. Or do you want to go 450? Or perhaps you want to go a little warmer. 
Maybe it depends on if you live in Siberia or Northern Canada. Maybe it depends on if you live in a Pacific Island, who gets to vote? Uh, who gets to represent different parties? No answers. Um, computer brain interface integrated human natural systems. What we mean by human is changing fundamentally. Look at the next one. Uh, we know that we're going to be birthing new mammoths. Um, there's a company that's been founded to do that, just uh, announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Russians are interested in it. Um, uh, we have the DNA. We also have the DNA for Neanderthals. If a Neanderthal is indeed birthed, uh, is it a human? If I connect myself directly to a mechanical system, am I still human? At what point do I stop being human? What we are doing is turning the human as a concept into an engineering space. The ethics and our ability to think about that productively instead of just uh, in as, as a tribal response to whatever's happening, uh, we really haven't focused very much on that. Custom designed space humans, this goes to genetic engineering. Uh, as you know, humans are not really well designed for space. As you may know, there are genetic abnormalities, quote unquote, that result in, for example, heavy and continuous bone formation. On the earth, uh, that is a disease. Uh, in space, that could well be adaptive. Uh, there are organisms on this planet that are very, very resistant to radiation. Uh, what happens if you put those genes into a person? Uh, can you create people that are uh, adapted to lesser gravity? And if you do, of course, you're consigning them to space because once you get on a planet, that's going to damage you. Again, uh, we haven't really thought about the implications. Technologically enabled telepathy. Uh, we're, we're well past the point where I can draw nouns and even very fuzzy motion pictures out of your brain so I know what you're thinking. Uh, that's already been done. Uh, what we're doing now is working on chip in the brain technology, which will uh, enable essentially telepathy. Uh, what happens when we hit that point? How much of human interaction is dependent upon the ability to be feeling one thing and yet think another? Diplomacy, for example, often succeeds because parties that loathe each other are able to come to an agreement. Uh, will that still work? Well, good question. Uh, what happens as we do chip in the brain and we begin realizing that in virtually all of these systems, it is the human component that is low bandwidth, that is, that is reducing our ability to respond to the complexity of the world. Do we begin to create metacognitive structures that are able to create cognitive solutions at a level that no human can access because we simply don't have the bandwidth? Uh, and as we do this, uh, who gets to decide agendas? who gets to decide what kinds of behaviors are appropriate and inappropriate. Memory design, uh, we're getting to the point where I can eliminate, tone down, or replace memories uh, in individuals. Uh, this obviously has, has significant therapeutic advantages uh, for, for cases of trauma, PTSD, uh, um, uh, uh, moral injury, uh, that is uh, uh, injury to one's uh, self-image uh, and, and ethical uh, self-image because of activities such as uh, military activities. What happens is I begin to be able to manipulate memory. More importantly, perhaps, what happens since memory is only part of the human cognitive structure and I am now developing the ability for example, using weaponized narrative to manipulate individuals to behave in ways that I would like them to behave without um, their knowing it. 2016 election in the US is a case in point, so is the Brexit campaign. And finally, what about making meat in factories so that you don't have to have cows belching methane and CO2 
so that you can free up that land to do wonderful things so that you use less energy to make a hamburger. Well, okay, that's interesting. It has a whole slew of, of implications. But of course, one of the big ones is that if you're in the cattle industry, uh, you're screwed. Now, given that exporting agriculture and pastoral products is one of the ways that developing countries begin to develop an economy that can then be uh, um, uh, jacked into uh, the global economy and provide uh, economic benefits for, for people in that, in that uh, developing country, uh, is this a good thing? Uh, if everybody's just making their own meat in their own country, uh, what happens to those exports? Does this begin to cut off very important mechanisms by which countries develop? And if it does, uh, who's responsible and what is the solution and who gets to vote? All of these, by the way, are at least in the research phase. Uh, some of them are deep research. I don't know of anybody that's actively working on custom designed space humans. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, essentially proven. Factory clean meat is, uh, is going commercial. Uh, radical life extension is being explored by the US FDA. So it's not that these are science fiction. These are very real. Uh, these are your world. And I think what this does is take us to the point where we begin to understand that the planet is infrastructure and that the human is infrastructure. We are the designers of ourselves, even as we design the world we're in to more reflect our interests. This goes very deep. Uh, for example, we're designing a world in which smallpox will not exist. Polio will not exist. Very few people are against this. Uh, on the other hand, if we wanted to design a world without pandas, there would be a lot of pushback. So we're already designing the world. We're just telling ourselves we're not because the implications of having to take responsibility for what we're already doing uh, tend to be fairly daunting. Cognition has become infrastructure. If you look across the globe, you see that there are bits and pieces of cognitive function, sensor systems, that is touch, feel, vision, uh, sound, are, are uh, ubiquitous. There are trillions of sensors today in the world built into all kinds of different systems and being deployed in the Internet of Things. Uh, cognition, uh, the good th the, the current AI model, which is basically neural net technology, is limited, but it is diffusing rapidly and it is far more uh, uh, effective than um, than anything that we have diffused into our global systems before. Every Tesla learns as it drives, but it just doesn't learn by itself. It learns because it feeds that information back to a central AI, which then feeds it out to all the other Teslas. It becomes a single learning entity. At what point do these learning entities begin to dominate the fragile, uh, heavily, uh, biased cognitive performance of individual human beings? A very good question. Uh, those of you that are not my age on this call uh, are going to be dealing with that. And I want to close by looking at, at one system in particular. Uh, this is a fascinating technology. You might remember Black Mirror in uh, October of 2016. Black Mirror is a science fiction show on Netflix. Um, had a show that talked about uh, essentially a social credit system. This poor young lady uh, had a low social credit score. She wanted to travel to a wedding. She just needed a few more points. The show is about her trying to get points and eventually, of course, crashing and burning um, because it is a noir science fiction show after all. Um, well, so I watched that with a bunch of fairly tech savvy people uh, when it came out. I, and we were all horrified at the authoritarianism and uh, gratified that it was only science fiction. Of course, what we didn't know that was that China was already rolling out precisely that system. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because it controls a lot of function 
what kinds of tickets you can buy, what kinds of hotels you can go to. Are you allowed on certain dating sites? Can you get a loan? Can you get into certain colleges? Um, these are already in play, although the system is still uh, under development in China. Um, and it's coupled to vast data harvesting which will in turn feed Chinese state AI, which will in turn give an advantage to Chinese AI over Western AIs, uh, in part because uh, Western uh, countries, particularly uh, the Europeans, are strictly limiting data accessibility. So what you end up with in China is a huge database social rating system that determines, <clears throat> excuse me, your position in society. Now, the American response to this is, oh my goodness, this is authoritarianism, it's terrible. That is not the Chinese response. The Chinese response is that this kind of infrastructure fits their culture very well. Under Confucian uh, uh, philosophy, the superior in fact has a duty to nudge people for whom he or she is responsible to moral behavior. Yes, the social credit system does exactly that. Moreover, because China doesn't have an explicit rule of law, the social credit system becomes a substitute for rule of law in that it provides a trust mechanism that can be broadly spread across the country. The result is that the social credit system in China can begin to overcome the traditional weaknesses of authoritarianism, things like the, the authoritarian control uh, center not being able to know what is actually going on around it, uh, lack of information and a brittleness. By providing that information up and down the system, it provides information on potential unrest and issues up to the uh, um, governance uh, mechanism the party in the case of China, uh, before it becomes critical and it helps the Chinese party governance system feed down uh, behavior mechanisms that enable social stability. So in some ways, this can become a very effective tool to implement soft authoritarianism. And the query is, does it make pluralism obsolete? There's an argument that it does. So speaking of invisible infrastructure, here you have a technology that most Americans have never heard of that in fact may be fundamentally shifting the fitness for governance in the 21st century from pluralism, which has a number of advantages uh, in spite of our current tribalism, to soft authoritarianism. The implications of that are huge. Very few people are thinking about it. Why? Because a lot of people that, that understand and think about technology don't think about social science and vice versa. So I leave you with um, Faust and I would uh, welcome discussion. Perfect, thank you, Brad, we appreciate that. Um, so, so really quick, we have a couple of questions uh, streaming in here, um, and we want to actually start out with one from Kevin here. And going off that last uh, topic that you were discussing, you mentioned the end of pluralism. And so he asks, uh, if you could comment on the nature of religion and its role in determining infrastructure, such as, is it possible that our, say, taxonomy and other specializations like these sciences preclude other considerations around just being human in general, like the impact of religion on infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. Um, by and large, uh, academics, unless they're studying theology uh, or in certain specialized areas, tend to be a little leery of religion. Um, uh, for a lot of people, it's too charged. Uh, it raises some very difficult uh, uh, ethical issues. Uh, and especially if you're over on the science and technology side, uh, those issues can become uh, uh, fairly intense. But I think if you're really going to understand the world as infrastructure and humans as infrastructure, you have to think about 
religion. I don't see how you can avoid it. Let's take uh, radical life extension. So I told you, I was thinking, you know, how many of you folks are going to be living to 150? How many are going to live longer than that uh, because of the advances in medical science? Well, first, of course, there's a huge equity issue involved there. We, we all see that. But secondly, there's a huge religious issue. How much of, of most world religions exist in part because of the anxiety about death implicitly or explicitly that they um, either mitigate or, or absolve through, say, heaven and, and the afterlife? Well, if, if you look at it that way, uh, trying to develop and implement uh, essentially biological immortality is a profound religious statement. And one could expect that once, you, once people begin to understand what you're about, there is liable to be a very significant pushback um, uh, on religious grounds. Uh, and in fact, that's part of what, if you'll remember the President's Council on Bioethics and CAS, that's part of what was going on there. Absolutely. And I think that pushback is so important to talk about. And, and this kind of stems to my next question. You, you mentioned earlier that the planet is infrastructure, humans are infrastructure, cognition is infrastructure. So, so my question for you is, is what is an infrastructure if all these things are considered? Um, if you could shed some light on that. Sure. I mean, one of the things about infrastructure is it, it scales profoundly uh, both in, in traditional uh, dimensions like uh, from a city to a state to a region, but also in complexity. Uh, the understanding the planet as infrastructure doesn't mean that we understand everything about it, because of course we don't. What it does mean is that it is being shaped by our decisions in such a way that it reflects human activity and as they say, the interface between humans and their external environment. That being the case, then we need to try to understand it and take responsibility for it to the extent we can. Um, uh, the, I, would, I would tend to draw at this point the line uh, 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 of infrastructure as being somewhere uh, around, uh, say, 10 to 25,000 miles uh, beyond the planet, because we have a lot of satellites in that space. Um, certainly, I mean, Jupiter, Mars, Europa uh, are not yet part of human infrastructure. So it's, I take a broad definition with the understanding that depending on what you're interested in, you're going to be looking at something much smaller. I mean, if I'm doing water in Scottsdale, um, I don't want to be thinking of the planet as infrastructure. That's just ridiculous. I want to be worrying about how to build a water system in Scottsdale, totally different scale. And I think realizing those priorities is really important, just so you don't get kind of overwhelmed with the macro versus the micro in that conversation. Yes, yes so absolutely. And, and on that note as well, I, I know a lot of people when they think of infrastructure, and we kind of made it these two overlapping areas, but they associate infrastructure growth networks with technology. So do you think it is critical that we act now to kind of safeguard the way that our future way of life, say policies, for example, um, is affected? Or should we take a more laissez-faire approach and just trust that we will be able to figure things out as they unfold? Well, so remembering that I have somewhat of legal background, uh, my answer is neither. Um, I think, I think that, that we tend to both dramatically overestimate and dramatically underestimate the extent to which we understand uh, uh, technology. I, if you look at, for example, some of the implications of, of the railroad, one of the things a railroad did was create the sense of time that we have now. Uh, uh, we all are clocked into various activities, going to class, the start of this lecture. That sense of time came with the railroad uh, because once you develop the railroad, you have to have a way to manage the network so that you don't end up with, you know, Casey Jones every day, right? Trains running into each other and everything else. So you have to have a sense of time that's coextensive with the network. 
So you tie the railroad, particularly to steamer lines and the rest of it, and you end up with a need for a global structure of uniform time, which we all now live in, and we're so familiar with it that it's essentially uh, uh, unconscious to us. We don't think about it at all, but it's artificial. I mean, time is a totally artificial concept, uh, but we need to clock our activities so that we can integrate the various things we're all doing in ways that, that uh, uh, reflect the complexity of our environment. Um, how to, you know, thinking about technology is, is a very difficult challenge. And I think one of the, one of the first things to try to understand is how little we really know about technology. Um, you know, it, it you, everybody's read all the famous quotes by, you know, people at IBM that said there was only going to be 10 computers in the entire world mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. None of us really know what these technologies are going to do. Um, uh, and that's why it's so fascinating now when the rate of change is so rapid. I mean, one of the lessons of the social credit system is that went from being science fiction to implementable at a scale that is essentially unimaginable 10 years ago with facial recognition. I mean, Chinese authorities are able to identify a criminal in a crowd of 10,000 people and arrest the individual. They've done that on in real time using um, uh, the existing AI that's the same AI that's powering the social credit system. I mean, that happened very rapidly. And the speed with which it happens means that it's very hard for us to understand what the implications might be. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean we can't act, but it does mean that we need to be careful in understanding our limits. For example, if you're, if you're working in the field of geopolitics, one of the things that has changed fundamentally in the last couple of decades is that we've gone from a Western-centric Western universalism, uh, um, Westphalian world order that is based on states, based on essentially Western values, uh, human rights, uh, and the rest of it. We've gone to a world that is uh, functionally multicultural. The Chinese and the Russians reject significant amounts of Western universalism. Uh, and, and things like human rights law. So do um, uh, certain religious uh, 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 communities. So I think that we need to be very careful when we try to think about these systems, not to be too um, uh, ethnocentric in the way we approach them and the way we, va we, we think about the values implicit in them. And that's part of the real problem. I mean, at the end of World War II, uh, the US was basically the country standing. Uh, the West, taken broadly, had won. And so we had the UN Charter of, of Human Rights. You wouldn't get that through today because it's a much more multicultural world. That's very hard for Americans to accept in particular. Uh, we're so used to dominating global values uh, that when that begins to fail, uh, we have a really hard time accepting it. So I want to try to combine a few of the points that you mentioned there with uh, talking about the inception of the railroad and the steam engines all the way up to China's credit system today and kind of the, the ideology of you know the Western values. And so we had a, an interesting question that kind of pulls that together. And we're wondering what impacts do various innovations you know across all of time like this, the capital, the, the credit system, the railroads and everything in between, what do innovations like this in the Western capitalism as whole have on development and these, these people, these individuals that are often overlooked in the system? That's virtually an impossible question to answer. Um, don't forget that the social credit system reflects Chinese values, not Western values. It's not a capitalist technology. It uses technology and a lot of technology, much of which was developed by private firms, but it is not a capitalist structure. Um, the, the question about how to think about um, capitalism 
technology uh, is really a, a very interesting one. And it depends on fundamental values that are gonna differ among communities. So for example, um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that somebody like Steven Pinker would point out is we have more people alive today with less violence um, than ever in human history. Uh, and most of them are living reasonably well. Absolutely true. Uh, one thing that somebody like Jeff Sachs might point out is um, inequality is significant and there are major parts of the globe that don't share in the uh, benefits that technology has brought to developed countries and particularly the elite in developed countries. Again, absolutely true. Um, thinking about those kinds of questions becomes very difficult because much of the framing that we do is done in teleological or static terms. That is to say, right now, um, uh, cities are, for example, not sustainable. Um, true, a lot of energy in, a lot of materials, a lot of waste out, so forth. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at human history, cities, and indeed, some of the existing cities today, are one of the longest lasting artifacts that humans have developed. So by that definition, they are sustainable. Uh, so the question, the question comes down a lot to framing. If I frame in terms of teleology or fundamental values, um, then I'm probably going to find that there's a lot I don't like about the world as I look at it today. But what about the world 20 or 30 years from now? Will it be better or worse? Uh, what's a good technology example? So take the printing press right? Printing press comes to Europe. Um, uh, 14, 14, late 1400s. Um, 1517, Martin Luther nails his theses on a church door. Great. Well, in the absence of a printing press, who cares? Because Martin Luther says, well, you got to read the Bible for yourself and you got to understand it for yourself. And the answer is, nah, everybody's illiterate. The only person they can possibly read in the entire community is the priest, the Catholic priest. So, I mean, it doesn't matter how many theses he wants to hammer up. But with a printing press, then the Reformation can happen. Then you get a huge jump in literacy. Then you get a huge jump in publications of all kinds which feed into the Protestant Reformation. And then you get 150 years of the most bloody warfare that Europe has ever seen. So the printing press, if 50 years after it was introduced, you asked if it was a good technology, the answer would be, oh my God, no, look what it caused. But you look at it now and we say, sure, because it's enabled the development of a civilization that has supported uh, many hundreds of millions more people on the planet um, in relatively uh, good condition for at least uh, many of them. Uh, and we hope we'll be able to improve uh, the condition for everyone. Uh, so we like the printing press. It's hard. When are you going to judge? What historical period? When are you going to draw a line and say, this is it, this is right, this is wrong? Um, we tend to be very dogmatic about the answer to that. Uh, it, it's a question we need to think about, but it's a question where I think we need to be very careful about dogmatic answers. And I would agree with you there. I think one of the most important things is how to frame these technologies, these rules, the regulations. And, and on that note, we had a really good question come in. Uh, because there are so many different ethics and values in the world in terms of technology, infrastructure, and various cognitive infrastructures, how could that be regulated? And maybe this is another impossible question. Is there a need for international agreement or something like the SDGs? Yeah. <laughs> <I'm>, exactly. <laughs> I'm not a, I don't know that international agreement, you know, the first thing that, that particularly in the Westphalian system, the UN and, and Western Europe and the United States, first thing we want to do is say, well, we need an international agreement. Um, and the problem with that is that if it's a simple system, you can do that. If it's a complex system, you can't. So let's take um, environment. Montreal Protocol. 
uh, it, it was very effective in reducing production and emission of CFCs and thereby uh, reducing the human impact uh, on the um, a stratospheric ozone layer. But what we didn't understand at the time was that's because that was a really simple system. There were two companies that made CFCs, uh, DuPont and ICI. Um, it was a relatively uh, minor industrial chemical with a set of uses where there were a number of alternatives. Uh, so it was fairly easy to address CFCs. So when we, climate change came up, we said, great, we'll use the same system. And of course it's failed um, uh, consistently since the UN process began. And the reason is it's a complex system and it's not going to respond to the kinds of simple solutions that the Montreal Protocol represented. Uh, regulating international regulation is the first thing we turn to. Um, so for example, right now in, in the UN, there's an effort to try to um, ban so-called lethal autonomous robots in warfare. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, the Western Europeans are very much in favor. Uh, they have no robots and they don't do a lot of, of warfare, which is good in a lot of ways, of course. Um, but the Russians and the Chinese are already introducing those into the field. Uh, the Israelis apparently have used some of them in actual uh, operations. Uh, under those circumstances, are the Americans likely to agree to an international resolution when they know that the Russians and the Chinese are already uh, deploying such technology? Probably not. The problem is international uh, agreements assume a cohesive international order. They assume the Westphalian order, and that's failing. We have no Westphalian order that is global at this point. Uh, look at look at uh, the the Sahel. Look at the Middle East. Um, look at Russia and China and their problems with at least some of the Westphalian order. So, I mean, yeah, we can try, but I think the chances that these technologies will be mitigated or stopped are pretty small. So you say, well, but surely there's some regulation. Well, there is. It's called uh, historical Darwinism, right? And by that, I don't mean the philosophy. I mean, at some point, somebody is going to be uh, hegemonic. That'll be determined by history. That'll be determined by how good their governance is. Um, I, we, may, we may be on the way out. By we, I mean Western pluralism with our ideals, with our free speech, with our freedom of religion. We may be toast. And it may be that, that some other form of governance is going to prove more fit in a highly complex world that's rapidly changing. So there will be a, there will be a solution, but we may not like it. So pulling it back to a more domestic angle, we had a good question come in. Where does the, the current Biden infrastructure bill fit into society and sustainability? And do you think they have considered the, the socio-technical aspects? Um, no, um, but I think, you know, in all honesty, they can't, right? I mean, American politics is so uh, tribal today that getting anything through is itself a major accomplishment. So, I mean, if you start with a beautiful, uh, socially beneficial, economically beneficial, environmentally beneficial, uh, statuesque policy, by the time it gets to our political system, it's going to be whatever little bloody bits you could drag through the process. Um, you know, everybody talks about making sausage. It isn't making sausage. You know, it's taking, it's taking huge and beautiful things and beating them into little bits of sand. Hmm. You know, it, they got it through. That in itself was a major accomplishment. Um, on balance, and I'm not talking about the 3.5 trillion, I'm talking about the, the one um, uh, smaller physical 
type infrastructure bill they passed. On balance, I think it was the best they could do. Uh, does that mean that it considered what it should? Of course not. But, but that's politics. It really never does. And that's an important point. A lot of times in these kinds of conversations, we talk about theoretical. And, and that's a good thing to think about and talk about. But it depends on how practical you want to be. Do you care about what you can actually do in the real world? If you do, then you have to be much more, uh, much more accepting in your thinking than many of us are because of our sort of, of um, tribal perspectives. Uh, I think on balance, the fact that they got anything through was pretty amazing. Um, is, it, is, it, is it beautiful? No, it's pretty beat up, but they got it through. And that's a step in the right direction, I suppose, right? It's better than nothing. I mean, we know, we know that we need action in that area. Uh, the physical infrastructure, just to go to that for a second, physical infrastructure in this country is in terrible shape. Um, and that's true in many countries. Germany, for example, which you, you think of as an efficient, well-functioning country, generally is, but partially because of the way they're afraid of debt, um, they haven't maintained their physical infrastructure very well. It's a, it's a major problem. China, on the other hand, has done pretty well. So you pays your money and you take your choice. Absolutely. So, so um, we, we did have an interesting question coming here and we're wondering, do the nature of not only the, the social science biases that are painfully present in American culture, but also the recent shift in this collective, as well as the, the lack of what would some refer to as like the big brother entity as, as seen in China. Do you foresee any variations of programs such as this functionality functioning in this country at any point in time? I think that, so, so a fundamental question, if you're looking at governance, and if any of you out there are interested, I, you know, email me and I have some stuff I can send you on that, a couple of things I've written. But a fundamental question on governance is, um, are the perturbations that drive our current problems uh, fundamental or are they transitory? Uh, if they're transitory, then we got a problem. But you know, I mean, we had problems during Vietnam. We had problems with, with, with uh, World War I, with World War II. We look back now and we think, boy, everybody was together, but they really weren't, not at the beginning. We had problems in the Civil War. America has always had problems. Um, that's kind of, our, that's kind of our, our modus vivendi. Uh, but the problems have never been so fundamental. They've never been uh, so demarked by, by moral judgment, not by disagreement about policy, but by moral judgment. If you are not of my tribe, you are evil. That's, that's a very dangerous trend. Because I think most of our current uh, issues, particularly tribalism, are driven by a uh, constitutional law, uh, which is increasingly dysfunctional, and B, by um, information trends. There's so much information out there that people are driven into tribalism so that they can, they can make sense of their life. Uh, I think that the chances that we're going to see a reverse in the destructive uh, uh, trends in pluralism are probably pretty small. So I think, I think things are gonna get worse until we make a fundamental decision about whether we're gonna try to save what we can of American constitutionalism, or whether we're just gonna go down like the Titanic with our flags flying, singing on the deck. I guess that's our decision and to uh, decide on, right? Well, yeah, because I mean, well, you know, I'm checking out of the Hotel California pretty soon, so it's you guys. <laughs> Inspiring words for the, the youth of tomorrow, right? <laughs> uh, so, so we actually have a question from one of our future panelists in this talk series, Ageshi. She asked, um, is the focusing on technology useful when it typically serves to reinforce existing biases? We speak of the social credit system or algorithmic bias as though they are somehow more sinister than the real life order that many of us face every day. Uh, so technology just makes them more efficient. 
So uh, is it useful to focus on this when, when it serves these reinforcing and existing biases? Well, that's part of the invisible infrastructure, right? I mean, if, you, if you're looking at a technology, um, you know, I mean, everybody likes to say technology is neutral, which is, um, I think, reifying technology in an unhelpful way sometimes. But if you look at technology, it's what people do. It's what they are. We separate technology from the human. And yet all you need to do is walk down the typical street and see how many people are glued to their, to their uh, mobile phones and realize that we are, we are fully integrated with our technology. For some purposes, like fixing water mains in Scottsdale, it's good to focus on the technology. But it's also important to understand that, that you know, as Pogo said, we are, we are the enemy. We are the technology. And, and to think of us as not integrated is going to get harder and harder. I mean, wait till, uh, wait till Elon Musk gets his brain networking, the one where he injects and it, it spreads out across the top of your brain uh, injected through your skull so that, so that you can, it's essentially a brain chip, only it's a net that covers your brain. He's already got a company that's, that's working on commercializing that. Once that begins to happen, the idea that we are our technologies is going to be very clear. Uh, why am I able to go into class as I will uh, later today and, and teach 100 students? It's because of a vaccine. What is a vaccine? It's a device that I put in myself to change myself to make me live longer. Well, it's already here. So I think, I think one of the ways to think about this is one of the fundamental things about complex systems is that you will never understand them, never. What you will do is you will pose a question to a complex system and your query combined with the structure of the system will give you what it is that you need to be working on. So it's neither a product of the complete underlying system nor a completely constructed product of just you. It is the interaction between you and the system that creates the space within which you're gonna operate. Um, and what that means is that it's never going to be a question of technology versus no technology. It may be a question of culture. It may be a question of economics. It may be a question of um, uh, uh, imperialism or colonialism or, or any one of a number of different things. It, it is a, it is a, uh, it is a product that is important to us because of the question we ask it. So if I have a question that's purely technological, it makes sense to talk about technology. If I'm talking about things like um, uh, the social credit system, then it makes sense to think about it more in terms of the culture because you could never do a social credit system in the United States. Uh, we're too libertarian uh, as, a, as a culture taken as a whole. Now you can do financial credit analysis. That's because it's useful, it's limited, uh, uh, and without it, you can't have things like loans because you don't know who to trust and who not to trust. So, so it depends on the question you ask as to whether technology is, is important or not. Absolutely, and, and I hate to say we're coming close to the end here with just a few more minutes. So I, I wanna ask, uh, as, as many people in the audience here are future global development practitioners in the field, what sort of wisdom do you have to take away from this? I mean, the, the, the promise of like design of infrastructure really depends on these assumptions that individual humans are capable of understanding their, their social system enough to design these. So how do we ensure that scientists, engineers, and other development professionals really create the infrastructure that is socially responsible? Well, so there's an interesting question, right? I mean, the first question is, uh, who gets to define socially responsible? That's, that's not going to be a unitary function. Uh, there's going to be very different definitions of that. And that drives you a little bit deeper. Um, uh, what values are we implicitly carrying with us when we um, uh, when we uh, uh, go into other countries 
uh, to design technologies, to design institutions, uh, to respond to crises, uh, whatever it is we're, we're uh, doing. Um, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, what you don't want to do is you don't want to let the complexity of the overall system uh, paralyze you, right? That makes no sense. So you want to do the best you can, but I think you want to try to practice approaching it as a problem solver. That is to say, learning how not to bring your particular tribal identity, which all of us have, me included, learning how not to bring that into a new situation. What is it that this situation calls for independent of what I would want to impose on it? Um, and then I think you want, you want to continue acting to try to make the world a better place. Um, you know, the, the danger of understanding our responsibility in a terraform planet is that it paralyzes us because of the complexity. And you can't do that. You have to keep acting to make the world a better place. And we know, we know how to do that. Uh, uh, there are things you can do. For example, practice being agile and adaptive. Why? Because the future is going to throw a whole lot of weird stuff at us. Uh, so you want to practice responding in, in new and agile ways as you get new information, which is exactly the opposite of the increasing tribalism that we're driving ourselves into. Um, so I think you can practice being effective in a very complex world, but it takes practice. And it takes a lot more humility than, than a lot of highly educated people are, are, willing to, uh, are willing to exercise. Yep, very true. And, and we appreciate that. And it's, it's really inspiring, I think, for me sitting here, but all of us as well. Um, as, as I see we're coming up to the end of the hour here, I do just want to send forth a quick thank you so much for taking the time today to speak to all My of pleasure. us. My pleasure. I know My you pleasure. appreciate that. I know you've given us all a lot to think about and, and talk about here moving forward. Um, and I, I do want to address, I know there was a number of questions that we weren't able to get to. So perhaps you and I can link up later, we can have them sent to you and we can find a way to get the participants and some of the viewers answers to some of these really engaging, thought-provoking questions, if that works for you. Sure. And if any, as I say, if anybody wants, wants anything on uh, governance issues, uh, which I've been looking at recently, just send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll send you a couple of articles. Perfect. We'll make Brad sure. Allenby at ASU.edu. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We'll send an email to the rest of the group, all the participants, to make sure they have that and anything else that comes forward. And I want to thank you and everyone else for tuning in and joining us for today's uh, very exciting talk. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.